It's a lie. The story that white supremacy has its knee on the neck of Black America is simply false. The idea that a Black person dare not step from their door for fear that the police would round you up or gun you down or bludgeon you to death is simply ridiculous. That's like not going outside for fear that I'll be struck by lightning. The tendentious interpretation of every one of these incidents of police and African-American encounter, such that it is read as if it were the latter-day instantiation of the lynching of Emmett Till, is clearly preposterous. And now, The Good Fight with Yasha Monk. Over the last months, Donald Trump has staged an unprecedented attack on our democracy. He has refused to accept the outcome of a free and fair election. He has spread wild conspiracy theories. And in the last days, he has even summoned a mob of insurrectionists to Washington, D.C., a mob which ultimately assaulted and invaded the Capitol, stopping elected representatives from doing their job. If there was a magic wand I could wave to remove Trump from office and make sure that we never have to hear from him or his most fervent supporters again, my arm would now be in need of urgent medical attention. But there isn't. All of the realistic paths for removing Trump from office are likely to fail and to have big adverse consequences. So I understand why so many Democratic leaders on Congress, I understand why so many writers who I trust and admire, many members of Persuasion's Board of Advisors have called for Trump to be impeached or for the cabinet to exercise the 25th Amendment. But I think it would be a big mistake. Here's why. The 25th Amendment would have the advantage that it would be many of Trump's own appointees starting those proceedings. So it wouldn't be a completely partisan action from the beginning. But it has two big disadvantages. The first is that it would be legally, at best, very dubious. It is supposed to be exercised when a president is physically or perhaps mentally incapacitated. That is simply not the case with Donald Trump. Trump is who he always has been, a dangerous, irresponsible, authoritarian populist who is morally unfit for the job. He's somebody who the American people should never have put in the White House. But it is simply untrue that he is incapacitated. And it is a bad idea to fight an anti-democratic president with anti-democratic means. The second problem is more straightforward. There's just no indication that Mike Pence or a majority of the cabinet are willing to take this step. In fact, the members of the cabinet who are most critical of Trump have chosen instead to resign. Now, impeachment is in some ways a more appropriate remedy. It is foreseen in the Constitution for high crimes and misdemeanors, and there's no question in my mind that Donald Trump has committed high crimes and misdemeanors in a variety of ways in office, but most clearly through his seditious refusal to accept the outcome of the election. The problem, as I argued at the time of the first impeachment trial, though, is that the bar is not just whether it would be fair and just to remove a president. This is a political tool, and the question is whether it actually is likely to stop them from doing harm to our republic. Now, before the first impeachment, a lot of writers predicted that everybody would turn on Trump, that Republicans would vote him out, that his approval ratings among the general public would plummet. None of that happened. It ended up being a straightforward partisan vote with a couple of small exceptions. Trump did not suffer in the approval ratings. It ended up being a big victory for him. I see no reason to think that this time would be different. In fact, many of the Republicans who did vote to certify the election just a few days ago 
who have distanced themselves from Trump more than they have at any point in the last four years would likely be forced to go back into the Trumpist camp and to give him one last victory on the way out. Look, the most difficult thing to do is to beat authoritarian populists in relatively free and fair elections. Very few countries around the world have managed to do that in the last years. The United States did. Joe Biden won 81 million votes and ended up carrying off a relatively clear victory in both the Electoral College and the popular vote. What we want people to focus on once Trump is out of office is the freely expressed will of the American people to make him a one-term president and ignore his irresponsible attempts to subvert our democratic process, not the machinations of congressional leaders in Congress. We have survived 1,450 days since Donald Trump took office. Scary for the next days may prove we can survive another 11. Today I'm joined by Glenn Lowry. Glenn is a very distinguished economist. He was the first tenured black professor in the economics department at Harvard University and one of the youngest overall at the university, I believe. He's now the Merton P. Stoltz Professor of Social Sciences at Brown University. And he's been a very interesting and critical interlocutor of economic and educational policy, social policy for the last 30 or 40 years. Now, along with uh, members of the Persuasion Board of Advisors like Thomas Chatterton Williams and John McWhorter, he is one of the most interesting sort of critical black voices disagreeing with some of the emerging progressive consensus in a lot of elite American institutions. We had a very broad conversation that ranges from thinking about the extent of progress that America has or hasn't made on racial matters to questions about how much we should actually worry if elite consensus goes wrong, how much of an impact that is actually likely to have on the world. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Glenn Lowry, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Yasha. It's good to be with you. So, Glenn, you are one of the most interesting and visible heterodox African-American commentators at the moment. I think you sort of fit into, in a strange way, it's a strange landscape, you know, people like Thomas Chatterton Williams and John McWhorter, uh, both whom are members of our board of advisors, uh, younger people like Coleman Cruz. I think in some ways you are perhaps the most conservative of them. What do you think this group has in common and what do you think you don't necessarily have in common? Well, we don't share a political ideology that would be easily classifiable than a left-right spectrum. As you say, I'm probably, quote, more conservative, close quote, more of a neoliberal, we were to throw around labels, less enthusiastic about the Democratic Party. But what we have in common, it seems to me, is a kind of against the grain iconoclasm, a kind of uh, stepping outside of the limits of respectable opinion on questions bearing on race. Each of the individuals you mentioned, Coleman Hughes, the young writer, a recent graduate of Columbia University, a fellow at the Manhattan Institute, Thomas Chatterton Williams, a writer I gather in his mid-40s by now, lives in France. His book, Unlearning Race, John McWhorter, a linguist, uh, Columbia University, an academic, uh, has been in this business of commentary on race for nearly a quarter century. These are all different people. Uh, others could be mentioned. Uh, we're all Black, and none of us have the endorsement of the, you know, sort of establishment, intellectual establishment of uh, African-American liberal opinion. We're all cutting against the grain to some degree. So how do you describe that establishment black opinion and how do you think it relates both to actually majority opinion within the African-American community and to the sets of views that you and some of these other people we've just talked about have? Well, it might be better just to enumerate a few cases. ta Coates rises to stardom. His book, Between the World and Me, becomes a huge bestseller. His essay on reparations becomes a kind of iconic Everyone must mention peace on advocating a certain kind of reaction to the problems of persisting racial inequality in American society. 
And people's reactions to that varied. And I would say that all of the people that you've mentioned, Williams had a very, I think, thoughtful and incisive critical review of ta Coates's book in the London Review of Books. John McWhorter and I also discuss this work critically at my podcast, The Glenn Show. Whereas the late, great Toni Morrison was saying of ta Coates, he's the Baldwin of our time. This group of intellectuals whom you've called attention to and we've been discussing here just now took a rather more skeptical and critical view. So this is a celebrated cultural icon in uh, contemporary African-American letters, ta Coates I speak of, who meets with adulation at every turn and finds himself facing some criticism from some African-American intellectuals. That would be an example of the iconoclasm or cutting against the grain that I'm calling attention to. Let's dive into that, because I think we're speaking at a slightly too abstract level right now. You know, what is it about Between the World and Me or about Tanahisi Coates' argument for reparations that you disagree with? Why do you think that this is an important fault line in our intellectual... I'd be speaking for myself. I don't claim to of be course. speaking for these other individuals whom you've mentioned. So we take Between the World and Me. So this is a very well-written, passionate, powerful in places poetic memoir, uh, open letter to his son, reflecting on the character of American society and the place of African Americans within it here in the early 21st century, despairing, furious, nihilistic in some ways. The American dream of fraud. You think white people have any interest in you? They just soon slice you to pieces, hang you from a tree, pull your body limb from limb. These people who happen to think that they are white are perpetrating the greatest plunder and crime against humanity. And as one looks at the history of their treatment of African-Americans, don't drink the Kool-Aid, don't believe the hype, don't sing the anthem, take a knee and steel yourself to the inevitability of white racism's a predatory treatment of your humanity. I actually don't think I'm exaggerating. And I think that is a absolute dead end. It is both an inaccurate social scientific and historical reading of the experience of African-Americans in the society. Indeed, Coates' own celebrity gives the lie to the argument he makes. It's also a spiritually deadening, turning within kind of response to the exigencies indeed that do confront African-Americans. This is not an easy path. This is a difficult path. But there is hope and there is light at the end of the tunnel of this path and so on. So let's dive into each of those elements that you mentioned. You know, how is this pessimistic view of the present moment and America's, especially recent racial history, wrong? And then perhaps afterwards we can talk about how it is the wrong guide to how we can improve the situation. So, you know, you say from a social science perspective, you disagree with codes. What's the nature of a disagreement? Why should we be more optimistic than he and some of the writers in his kind of cluster of thinkers are? Have you noticed what's happened here in the United States in the last half century? When Gunnar Myrdal published An American Dilemma in the 1940s, this is the Swedish economist brought over here by the Carnegie Endowment to survey the condition of, quote unquote, the Negro in American society at mid 20th century. The modal occupation for African-American men was farm laborer, And the typical occupation for African-American women was domestic servant. The median family income of Blacks compared to whites was about 0.5. The status of African-American education, of African-American voting rights and citizenship, of African-American access to the professions was abysmal. This is within my lifetime. You look at what has happened in the last 50 years for African-Americans, a huge middle class has developed. There are Black billionaires. The influence of Black people on the culture of America is stunning, and it has global resonance. We are the richest and most powerful people in large numbers of African descent on the planet. It's not even close. There are 200 million Nigerians, and the gross national product of Nigeria is less than $1 trillion per year. America's GDP is over $20 trillion a year, and African-Americans have claimed to roughly 8 or 9 or 10 percent of it. We're five to eight times richer than the typical Nigerian. As I say, the very fact that the cultural barons of America, the people who run the New York Times and the Washington Post, who give out the Pulitzer Prizes and the National Book Awards, who are at the MacArthur Foundation, 
and are manning the human resource departments of corporate America have hook, line, and sinker bought into the new woke racial sensibility gives the lie to the pessimism that ta Coates spews. The American dream is a fraud. Are you killing me? Tens of millions of people have come to this country from every corner of the world in the last 50 years, again, within my lifetime, most of them from non-European points of origin. When you take a look at the history of what has happened for these immigrant populations, they are realizing the American dream. This is an open and free society. So I think I, again, could go on in that vein, but the basic point is, it's a lie. The story that white supremacy has its knee on the neck of black America is simply false. The idea that a black person dare not step from their door for fear that the police would round you up or gun you down or bludgeon you to death, is simply ridiculous. That's like not going outside for fear that I'll be struck by lightning. The tendentious interpretation of every one of these incidents of police and African-American encounter, such that it is read as if it were the latter-day instantiation of the lynching of Emmett Till, is clearly preposterous. At Qualcomm, we believe in staying connected, and you can see us wherever 5G is helping transform telemedicine, supporting remote education, and powering mobile PCs. The Invention Age is here. Learn more at qualcomm.com slash invention age. So what you're saying is very interesting. And you know, one of the things that makes me think about is one of the seminal articles you wrote in the mid-1980s in the New Republic called A New American Dilemma, which precisely plays off of Gunnar Myrdal's seminal work that you talked about. But it was in many ways just descriptively quite pessimistic because it was talking in part about the rise of a kind of socioeconomic underclass of African-Americans, particularly in the inner cities and the huge problems you saw there. So I guess you have a different, and did at the time, have a different account of the causes of some of these problems than you know, people like Ta-Nehisi Coates would today. But just descriptively, it seemed quite pessimistic. So I guess I would like to know where your thinking is on that. Do you think that actually there's more reason for optimism than there was then? Or do you agree with the pessimism in the description of a condition of a section of the African-American population, but you simply disagree about the causes of it? I wouldn't quite put it in those terms. I was alarmed about in the 80s and 90s and remain alarmed about the lagging condition of a segment of the African-American population poorly educated, poorly or not at all employed, dependent on public services, living in housing projects, living in enclaves of concentrated poverty and privation in urban areas, and so on. This is 20%, 15% of the Black population. This is not a small problem. This is a big problem. Jails overflowing with young Black men, huge disparities in the acquisition of cognitive functioning, uh, reading and mathematics ability as assessed by educational testing and so on. Schools not working in these inner cities. Family disruption, uh, three quarters, 70% of kids born to a black woman in this country, even today born to a woman without a husband. Some of those are living perfectly stable and ordinary lives. Some of them are suffering the worst privation that one can imagine in the society. I was concerned about the so-called Black underclass. We don't use that kind of language anymore, about persisting, concentrated urban poverty and the despair of life at the bottom. I think those problems remain with us. Maybe, however measured poverty rate, the incidence of unemployment and incarceration and so forth, maybe less severe in the year 2020 than they would have been in the year 1990. But those problems are still with us. But the question is, as you suggest, where do I point the finger or what do I think are the ultimate and root sources of the problem? And to the extent that I see those as a result of failures of public policy or of government action of the larger society, do I think that society has the capacity to remedy that situation? And in my critique of ta Coates' nihilistic pessimism, I'm saying that I see progress, notwithstanding the continued existence of these problems. And moreover, I see reform as a real vehicle. And the reform I have in mind is not specifically racial reform. The reform I have in mind is the progressive political project of creating a decent society for all Americans, health care for all Americans, reformed education for all Americans, and a government that commits itself to strengthening the safety net for all 
all Americans. So I don't take lagging Black poverty, and that certainly is the case, or the disparate overrepresentation of African Americans in prisons, which also is certainly the case, as fatal flaws of American society echoing yet again the age-old story of contempt for African American humanity. I take them as serious problems, a remnant of our history, embedded within a larger set of problems which affect the society as a whole and susceptible to remedy through conventional reform politics of the sort that I think, you know, most decent people would be prepared to affirm. So, you know, I'm broadly on your side of this debate in the sense that I, too, am quite optimistic about the progress we've made over the last 50 years and the progress we're likely to make in the next 50 years. And I'm actually writing a book arguing both for how to deal with diverse democracies around the world and and making the case that we haven't done everything wrong. And I think that's very important because it implies that we certainly need some reforms, we certainly need some changes. But if we throw out all of the principles and ideals that have allowed us to make that progress over the last 50 years, we're actually making a big mistake. But the point on which I feel the argument from the other side is strongest is all of these facts you've just mentioned. A much higher rate of poverty, much higher rate of people who can't access a, a decent education, the higher unemployment rate, the higher rates of social dysfunction that you do see in some of these segments of the African-American population. And so what's your case for optimism about that? Or rather, what kind of things do you think we should do in order to remedy that? It's not clear to me. I think there's a kind of split on the more quote-unquote woke side of this debate. I think actually codes in some ways, as you're saying, is quite pessimistic about the ability of getting anything done. I mean, certainly between the world and me, it just reads like a lament that's not really a call of action. There's people more like Ibram Kendi who seem to believe that if we sort of turn our society into an anti-racist society and found a department of anti-racism and so on, then that would be the way to sort of remedy those problems. So in an odd way, I think Kendi probably has an even starker view of America in some ways than Coates, but is actually more optimistic, I think, about the possibility of remedying some of these problems. What do you think we need to do to make progress on this set of issues? I don't have any magic bullets here, Yasha. I don't have anything to say that hasn't already been said. Say it again. (laughs) I think there's some sort of frontline issues. So with respect to the social safety net and the welfare state, healthcare is the main area, it seems to me, in which there are hurdles remaining to be overcome education reform and expanding options and opportunities for people who are dependent on publicly provided educational services in places where they're not working so well. So I don't have a beef against charter schools. Some work well, some not so well, but I think we should be willing to open things up and experiment there. Nothing I'm going to say here is a specifically racial remedy. I don't follow Ibram X. Kendi's urging of us to amend the Constitution or in other ways institute large-scale legal intervention on behalf of a program of anti-racism. I actually think de-emphasizing the racial dimension of these problems and working to build uh, class-based coalitions across racial lines is the way to go. I don't think the cops are the problem in the urban areas, although there are problems with cops in urban areas. I'm quite happy to see them dealt with. Cops should be held accountable for what they do. But the creation of a civil environment in which people can rely on the security of their person and their property is an essential prerequisite for community revitalization. And I think the cops are a part of the solution to that problem, not appropriately demonized as the embodiment of this boogeyman of age-old American racism. But I'll confess, I don't have I don't have a policy agenda here. I'm, I'm not in possession of any specialized knowledge or insight about what to do about these problems. Other than I want to stress, they are problems facing Americans, not just problems facing Black Americans. There are solutions which require politics, and politics requires a majority at the polls. So we need to frame the claims that we want to pursue in ways that we can attract a majority of the Democratic participants to support them. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things in this discussion, I think, is that the problems that you pointed out in that article in the 1980s about the African-American community already existed in a different concentration among parts of, for example, the white population 
population, but have really intensified among those segments of the population. So, you know, in many ways, the things you write about in that article could have been about the world depicted in hillbilly allergy or something like that, right? Oh, that's absolutely so, right. I mean, Charles Murray in his book, Coming Apart, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, makes this, um, uh, Robert Putnam in his book, Our Kids, also makes this argument, the argument being that the loss of a sense of security and the possibility of hopeful lives for families and their children is seeping into what we might have taken to be characteristic of African-American life, seeping into American life much more broadly. And there's a lot of white poverty and alienation. You mentioned J.D. Vance, Hillbilly Elegy. I would also call to listeners' attention Matthew Desmond's book, Evicted, which is a study, ethnographic study of housing insecurity in the city of Milwaukee, built around his close examination of families in two communities on different sides of town, white and black, both of whom, both sets of families, are beset by all manner of difficulty associated with them simply not being able to pay the rent and finding their stuff set on the street outside of their former residences. And the politics of this, in my view, requires of us a view of these problems that is broader than simply a racial claim. Making white supremacy the boogeyman doesn't get me to 50% plus one of the electorate necessary to enact broad-based social policy. So... Since you mentioned earlier that you consider yourself a neoliberal, which is rare these days for somebody to own that term, let me run one sort of interpretation of what caused these problems past you, which I think is very common and which presumably you'll disagree with. So one way of thinking about this is to say, look, this is all a result of neoliberalism, or it's all a result of sort of unbridled capitalism. And the first sort of set of people in the United States to really feel the brunt of this was African-Americans because they had fewer protections and perhaps fewer and less inherited wealth and fewer social protections. And so you saw a lot of these sort of social cultural consequences of these economic pressures in black communities before you saw them anywhere else. But as neoliberalism ran rampant and as sort of globalization intensified and so on, those same effects then were exported to other kinds of populations. And so if you see the dysfunction of hillbilly allergy and you see the dysfunction you described in your article in the 1980s, it all comes from that same or related sort of economic route. And so you know, the only way to deal with this is to contain or even abolish capitalism, something like that. I think that's my best attempt of, of trying to ventriloquate that argument. I presume you disagree. What's wrong with that story? I was just saying, clearly your heart is not in making that argument, but that's okay. What's wrong with that story is it's just proven wrong by history. What do you mean capitalism needs to be abolished and replaced with what exactly? I mean, what evidence is there in the historical record that socialism practiced anywhere produces a society in which ethnic and racial and sectarian inequalities are diminished, in which the potential for economic growth, the benefits from which being extended broadly in the society is realized, in which the power of technological innovation and creativity is unleashed? Where is the society that has embraced socialism as a framework of organizing economic activity in which any of these things that we think are good things have actually been realized? It's the role, as Friedrich von Hayek said a while ago, to serfdom to uh, centralize economic decision-making on behalf of political objectives and overriding the consequences. And this is why I call myself a neoliberal. I, I don't mean to be too arch ideologically in saying so. I just mean to affirm that organizing economic activity through market prices, incentives, private property, the pursuit of profit is the most effective way of solving the economic problem in large societies. And organizing economic activity through politics, planning, central control, bureaucracy, and regulation is a way of impoverishing yourself. That's what I think the historical record shows. That's what I think it shows in the developing world, where we have seen revolutionary transformation of the quality of life of hundreds of millions of people in South Asia and East Asia. We have seen it as a consequence of permitting the creative and remarkably effective coordinating power of people responding to prices through markets 
with the incentives thereby generated in pursuit of their own well-being as the engine of that prosperity and that transformation. I'm not saying globalization doesn't have its problems, among which are displacement and the undermining of subtle ways of engaging in economic activity. A decent society will not be indifferent to the consequences of having open markets undermine the livelihoods of tens of of millions of people. A decent society will seek to use some of the surplus benefit generated through market structures with a government that taxes and uses the public fisc to underwrite the cost of taking care of its people to soften the blow for those who are displaced. But I think that should be the thing softening the blow, but allowing the forces of modernization, of economic integration, of globalization, more or less unfettered to play themselves out. Building walls, preventing goods from moving across borders, inhibiting the adoption of new technology, stifling innovation, punishing success, that's no way to feed the poor. The poor starved to death in societies that decided that they were going to grow the wheat from Moscow or whatever, those people starve to death. That's my answer. History refutes the socialist claim, in my view. You know, there's one thing that I find puzzling in the specific American context, which is you see that in debates about free speech, but I think in some ways you also see that in debates about a more state-controlled versus more free enterprise vision of a country. And that's that, you know, there is a deep strain of pessimism in some aspects of black political thought, but more deeply, I would say, in a sort of left progressive political thought. I think this is more about your positioning on the political spectrum than it is about which ethnic group you belong to. And according to that sort of pessimistic vision, you know, this country is deeply white supremacist and it hasn't made any kind of progress. And government and the important institutions are all sort of lined up against the success of African Americans. And yet it often is the people who believe that who are champion, for example, restrictions on free speech, who think that Facebook and Twitter and other kind of platforms should censor a lot more. And what always puzzles me is sort of the cognitive dissonance there, right? Like, how is it that the people who are telling us that this society is deeply white supremacist at every level seem to have a faith that the would-be censors would all be on the side of the just and the good and, you know, censor the evil people who they consider, you know, politically unacceptable rather than them. And there's something sort of similar here that perhaps has been less remarked upon on the economic level, that the idea is somehow among people who are actually very pessimistic about what the American state is, is nevertheless that, you know, an economy in which the state plays a much bigger role would uh, in fact be liberating and empowering rather than discriminatory. I mean, if you have as bleak a view of the United States, as a lot of the left does, you should be the first to oppose single-payer health care because you should expect that single-payer health care would actually systematically discriminate against Black people at every level. So there's a strange dissonance there that I can't quite explain. I don't know whether you have a theory about it. No, I don't. I don't think I have much to add to what you've said. I think you make some good points. You know, the belief that you're always going to be in control of the microphone or always going to be in control of the apparatus, I do think seduces people. And a precedent that gets established because, well, Donald Trump is president and he's completely unacceptable and Neanderthal and dangerous to the, you know, et cetera. Therefore, journalistic integrity goes out the window. Therefore, the mechanisms of public expression have to be regulated so as to make sure that Trumpian views don't get disseminated through social media platforms and so forth. And then people forget that or don't take cognizance of the fact that precedents having been so laid down may well be available. You know, let's impeach the president over basically nothing at all because he's a bad president and we don't like him. We have control of the apparatus. Let's go ahead and do it. Those chickens can come home to roost. That that precedent, which having been laid down, can be available to anybody And you're not always going to have control of the microphone or of the podium. So what I see going on in college campuses disturbs me deeply. It's been a few years now. The police commissioner from New York City uh, came up to Brown University, where I teach, to give a lecture defending his stop and frisk policy. This is Ray Kelly. The year is 2014, if I'm not mistaken. And he shouted down. And I say to my colleagues who basically rally behind the students who prevented a speech from taking place at my university because they thought the speaker was quote-unquote a racist. 
He was appointed by Michael Bloomberg, who was elected three times mayor of New York City. This was the police commissioner of New York City. The policy of stop and frisk was actually in play. It warranted to be debated. What is a university for except to debate the policy? I won't go on long about this. They wouldn't let him speak. And my colleagues then patted the students on the back and said, uh, what leadership you show in standing up for your values and protecting the institution from this kind of moral assault. And I thought, my God, we are destroying our institution on behalf of a very short-term political benefit. Whatever you might think about stop and frisk, surely the ability to have open deliberation about controversial public matters in a university should take priority over the petulant adolescent tantrum being thrown here on behalf of chest beating, self-righteous. We know how to police a city. We know how to keep 8 million people safe. We're quite sure that we could bring the homicide rate down from over 2,000 a year in the 1990s to under 500 a year in the 20 teens, as the New York uh, public officials had managed to do. And we're not going to allow any alternative argument. I thought that was a horrible poisoning of the well. I give it as one example of a sensibility, of a kind of triumphalist sensibility. I have control of the institution today, not realizing that that practice lays down a predicate for those who may come after you with very different views who will have control of the institution tomorrow. Yeah, I think there's sort of two things going on here, right? Like one is, well, perhaps three things, actually. So one is that there's a lack of thinking through what precedent you set, right? There's a long-established concept of the veto of the person who's most willing to create chaos and disruption. And it may, at the beginning, feel like that's the students. But actually, if you operationalize the hackless veto, it's not at all clear that this is not going to be actual racists and white supremacists who come to campus and protest every time that you have a speaker that they don't like. And then that effectively you know, blocks all kinds of uh, political speech of which uh, some of the students might be more uh, favorable themselves, right? So one is sort of around precedent. The second, which you mentioned, is about the long-term future of an institution, right? To say, okay, look, we're going to give the president all kinds of powers to do good things, and we're not thinking about the fact that the next president may be somebody we rather dislike. And that's obviously true at the university level as well. I wonder for whether the third and perhaps most important argument is slightly different. And that's about the difference between the spaces in which writers and journalists and students and political activists operate and the nation as a whole. You know, that sort of weird dissonance where somebody can both think that the country is deeply white supremacist in every respect, but the right people are always going to be in charge comes from the fact that if you're sitting in Providence, Rhode Island at Brown University, or if you're sitting in Cambridge, Massachusetts at Harvard University, the people who make the decisions from your perspective, in fact, much as you might just like them too and have disagreements with them too, are broadly speaking the right kinds, right? They clearly are they very sympathetic and so on. And there's sort of not enough thinking through what it would mean to implement some of those institutions at the level of a much bigger society. So, you know, I think psychologically or phenomenologically, the odd predicament that a lot of progressive activists find themselves in is that they're in worlds where they are super majority, where everybody disagrees with them all of the time but they're deliberating about a society where they're a tiny minority. And I'm not talking about it in ethnic terms, I'm talking about it in political or ideological terms. And I think often that disjunct leads to very, very strange distortions. Yeah, again, I don't have much to add to that. I, I think that's right. Bubbles of various kinds, because we can self-organize ourselves, not just in terms of geographic space, but also in terms of virtual connectivity. We can self-organize ourselves into echo chambers of interaction that reaffirm what we already believe. We selectively seek out sources of information that we can anticipate will confirm what we already believe and so on, which is what makes it possible for strange things like the 2016 presidential election to take place. What, and I think this is, by the way, one of the arguments that I always make when people ask me sort of what the stakes of this are. I mean, I think one of the stakes of this is that you know, it has real electoral consequences when you let some of this stuff go unchallenged. Nevertheless, I guess I have a question that I'm grappling with myself and I'd love you to help me with about how important all of this stuff that we like to get exercised over is. And I, I am exercised by it. So this is not a sort of, it's not a trivial question in my mind. You know, one way of thinking about this is that I have a sort of feeling that there's a civil war of the elites going on at the moment. That if you take a highly educated person on either side of a political spectrum, 
their political views are going to be very, very far apart and they will really see each other as quite nasty and evil. I think if you go to a random member of a population of medium education or to a member of a population who is of low education, they're going to agree on far more things and they're actually going to have a less nasty view of each other. And one of the questions in my mind for the next decades of American history is whether the elites managed to impose their cultural civil war on the rest of the population or whether average Americans actually managed to resist that, which would, I think, somewhat contain our political polarization. So that's one way of putting the question. A different way of putting the question, I think, is sort of about, I guess, base and superstructure, to speak in sort of somewhat Marxian terms. You know, do the ideas that are prevalent in the class of people who are going to go on from Brown University to be investment bankers at Goldman Sachs or the people who run the New York Times op-ed page, the professoriate, Uh, Do these things actually matter and can they actually screw things up in a substantive way if there is a consensus that is wrong or that emphasizes racial conflict in a way that perhaps is not true to reality and so on? Or is that stuff ultimately irrelevant because the real sociological and economic processes that are going on are much more powerful, which would argue for perhaps we shouldn't be too worried, even though perhaps as writers and professors we have a personal stake in it, it's not as big a concern for society. So I guess my question is, if presuming with you that sort of you're on the right side of this argument and Curtis is on the wrong side of this argument, how much turns on who wins this argument? How worried should we be about that? And how much should we invest in fighting this battle? Uh, I don't see myself as on a different side from Coates in that respect. We're talking past each other. But let me address your questions or your observations. One is about elites and less elite peoples and whether or not elite disputes are more sharply drawn And because of the power of elites to shape the larger discourse, those disputes get imposed upon people who might be less archly in opposition to one another. And I don't know about that. I wonder about some of the issues that we disagree about, that is, we politically disagree about abortion. Is that really an elite conflict of uh, feminist and women's right protectors on the one side and traditional religious leaders on the other side, or is that a much more basic and intractable difference that is shared across the class strata in the society? I'm inclined to think the latter. Or climate, is the debate about climate, uh, climate alarmism, climate denial and all of that, about the urgency of, you know, Green New Deal and all of that, is that really only an elite dispute? I mean, I don't know. I just say, I think your framing might be an oversimplification of the source of these different positions in the culture wars. So let me defend my position. I think this is an interesting disagreement. So let's take abortion and let's take an issue actually like police violence. So on police violence, I think it's quite clear to me that there is a kind of consensus in among the majority of Americans with different emphases and with some real disagreements. But I found it striking looking at polls over the last months that, you know, a supermajority of Americans, for example, believed that Derek Chauvin had committed murder in his handling of George Floyd. A supermajority of Americans believed that there is a real problem with police violence and that we need serious police reforms. But a clear majority of Americans also think that we should maintain the current level of police or even increase it. And that includes a very clear majority of African Americans who don't not want police in the neighborhoods, they want police they can trust. And so on this, you know, when you look at the elites, it's sort of Blue Lives Matter on the one end and defund the police on the other end. When you actually look at what ordinary Americans believe, they have a much more sophisticated view of it, I think, actually. And it's sophisticated precisely because they don't follow the partisan cues that tell them they should only believe one part of a picture or the other part of a picture. I think on abortion, there's something similar. I mean, there's clearly very deep emotions about abortion in this country, and there's clearly a significant number of Americans on each side of the debate who really think that the other side is evil. I think there's also a quite clear majority of Americans who want abortion, in the words of Bill Clinton, to be safe, legal, and rare, who don't want a total ban on abortion, that is an unpopular position in the United States, but who also are morally concerned about abortion and who oppose some of the ways in which... You explain the phenomenon of the Kavanaugh confirmation battle? Well, I don't know how many Americans were really that invested in it. That's the question I'm asking. Was that really just an elite uh, spat? And down underneath, people were much less uh, mobilized about it, much less agitated about it. I'm really asking. I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess my best guess is that if you would go into an average bar or diner or whatever the cliche here is, pick up line in front of a school where parents are waiting for their children and and you ask people about the Kavanaugh hearing, I mean, I'm sure that a lot of people said, I, I guess, you know, I mean, I tend to be more liberal, I'm against him, or I tend to be more conservative, I'm for him, or something like that. I mean, I think there would have been some amount of partisan cue, and there's a significant proportion of Americans who clearly consider themselves either liberal or, or conservative. But I think the intensity of feeling would have been very different from what it felt like on cable news. And of course, there would be a significant number of Americans who say, you know, I'm moderate, I don't know, perhaps he's all right, perhaps not, I don't really have a strong view. I mean, there would be a lot of Americans who just have no view at all. Say, I'm not really interested in politics. I don't even know who Kavanaugh is. Is he some kind of judge or something? I'm not sure. Okay, I'm not a public opinion expert. I mean, I also think about uh, Trump's refusal to concede this election and the widespread claims of fraud, and it was stolen from him, that I gather a significant fraction of Republicans believe to be the case. They can't all be elites. And a non-trivial uh, fraction of independents, I don't have the numbers offhand, you might know them, think that there's something to it. And that just feels to me like a much deeper schism than merely a dispute amongst uh, intellectuals and uh, political leaders. When I look at actual developments on the ground, I'm mostly optimistic, right? I think that race relations have actually improved a lot. The share of the economy that's taken by non-white Americans keeps increasing. There's clearly a very vibrant and still growing black middle class, but that's also true of Latinos who hugely improve in economic performance, obviously of Asian Americans, of a lot of the black immigrants, I mean, Nigerian Americans and so on, who are doing very, very well in this country. And I think actually on the ground, there's also more friendship and more joint business ventures and more marriages across racial lines. And all of that makes me very, very optimistic. At the same time, I'm, and here I think I'm really with you, pessimistic about the intellectual developments among, you know, the American elite. I'm personally very worried, for example, about the way in which a lot of elite schools, elite private schools now take eight-year-olds or 10-year-olds and put them in these separate racial affinity groups and basically try to impose a deep race consciousness on these kids in ways that I think just the way that social psychology works is actually more likely to breed conflict and to make them think of each other as very, very separate, rather than overcoming some of the prejudices and so on that undoubtedly exist among kids as well. And so what I struggle with is how much weight should we give to the sociological and economic developments on the ground, and how much weight should we give to those more sort of, I suppose, ideological developments among the American elite? To what extent will the American elite manage to screw up some of the positive developments on the ground? Okay, I can see a reason for concern there. Well, recently I've been uh, writing about affirmative action, for example, and saying, and this is in college admissions, let's say you take the case at Harvard as a case in point, but I mean the argument that I'm about to make to apply more broadly saying, here we are now, 50 years down the line, and the big ideological argument about affirmative action has been won by pro-affirmative action forces. That is, I think the ruling Supreme Court precedent here is from the early aughts, Sandra Day O'Connor writing for the uh, court in the University of Michigan cases and basically saying, uh, yeah, you can do this, uh, but hopefully we won't be doing it forever. But it does look like we're going to be doing it forever. And the underlying issue is a relative paucity of African-Americans performing in terms of demonstrated intellectual mastery at a level that uh, permits them to be selected into very elite and competitive venues of intellectual performance on numbers that are politically acceptable. Too few Blacks at Harvard. Now, to my mind, that is a challenge of development. What do we need to do to enhance the achievement in this part of the population, I speak now about Black people uh, in the United States, such that they're penetrating in terms of objective performance into this high level of strata of uh, recognized excellence in American society is more representative of their numbers in the overall population. But in fact, what we've done, what we are doing, and I think we're in the process of institutionalizing it as a permanent way of doing business, is it affect except the reality of differences in performances between these populations at this right tail of extreme achievement, 
and basically use different criteria for selecting students into these elite venues for Black and Latino and for others. And I think that's a terrible mistake. And I think it's an elite mistake. I mean, that is, this is about gatekeepers trying to solve a political problem of how to manage their brand and their image so as to be politically acceptable in the broader society. And it is, I think, a long way from being racial equality. What we really need to be concerned about is primary and secondary education and the basic provision of educational opportunity to youngsters, which if it were done in an adequate way on the assumption that the intrinsic human capacities of populations doesn't differ measurably by race, we wouldn't be having to engage in the affirmative action practice in the first place. But the elite conversation is about the latter, not the former. Yeah, I think that's right. So, you know, I'm, I don't know, I, I'm conflicted about how to think about some of these policies at Harvard and so on. I'm much more worried about a policy that the school district in San Diego just passed, which is that because grades for African-American students lag significantly below grades for white students in the district, which presumably comes from the different socioeconomic conditions, they abolished the grading system. And so instead of thinking, well, hang on a second, we're failing our black students, what can we do as a school, as a society, to give them better opportunities to make sure that they acquire the skills they need in order to succeed in the world, we say, well, let's shoot the messenger and abolish the grades that show us that there's a problem. I mean, that to me seems like it really could perpetuate the problem to a significant degree. And I guess the question is, is that typical? Is this intellectual consensus going to really lead to policies that are so counterproductive that they affect the long-term trajectory of a country in important ways? That was the point that I wanted to make. It's not just about race. When you get rid of grades, you're degrading the ability to assess relative performance for everybody, not just black compared to white. So at some level, if you get rid of the graduate record examination to vet applicants to uh, technically sophisticated postgraduate programs of study and say that I don't want to use the test, if you take the exam schools in New York City, the Bronx High School of Science and Stuyvesant and all of that, and eliminate the very rigorous examination protocol used to identify top performing students in order to compose your class, you're debasing the currency of the realm for everybody. You are abandoning judgment for everybody. That is taken to its extreme, a threat to civilizational standards more broadly on behalf of the project of racial egalitarianism. Blacks don't measure up on this criterion relative to others for reasons that are complicated and historical, but nevertheless, they don't measure up. Therefore, we'll get rid of the criterion altogether so as not to expose the disparity of performance. That's a horrible place to be. I have a sort of perhaps slightly strange question to round off this conversation, but something that I've heard from a lot of people, which is that, first of all, there's a lot of young thinkers and writers who, you know, are worried about writing what we think, we're worried about letting the mind go where it may because we're so aware of where some of the tripwires are and how that might place them outside of a social circle, how that might inhibit some of the opportunities. Um, and ironically, I think, you know, if you're white, you have particular worries about potentially courting accusations of bigotry or something like that. But I think actually, if you're non-white, you face a very strong version of this as well, because the accusation of being a quote-unquote race traitor or something like that, I think has a particular sting as well. What would you say to young writers and thinkers about how to lead an intellectually vibrant and productive career in which, you know, they're duly attuned to their good interests in which they don't cease being able to actually find an audience and find the kinds of positions that enable them to have that audience, but in which they're intellectually honest and have an impact. I would say read Vaclav Havel, (laughs) The Power of the Powerless. This is the Czech politician, playwright, intellectual, active in the early days of the intellectual resistance against communist rule in Eastern Europe, Samistat, and all of that, writing to give an account of what is the role of a dissident in society breaking ranks, speaking out, saying it against the grain because it's what you think, venturing into the forbidden territory. This is the most fertile kind of activity that you can be engaged in. If the emperor is naked and no one is speaking, the fellow who shouts up, my God, where is the emperor's clothes? 
is a transformative figure in the history of the society in question. And the, the issue here is not political, it's moral. And the issue is existential. It's about how do I want to live? How, as an intellectual, will I live? And Havel, in this, I think, great essay, The Power of the Powerless, explores this territory. I mean, he asks, what is the most fundamental choice that we're going to make? And it's about whether or not we live in good faith, whether or not we live within the truth or we live within the lies. Suppre- Imagine the alternative to speaking out and bearing the slings and arrows that come with that. The alternative is to suppress. It's to suppress your intellect. It's to suppress, suppress your critical faculty. And ultimately, it's to suppress your very being. You become a kind of slave. You become less than fully human. You're reduced to an automata. You are a rubber stamp. You are simply another one in this mass of humanity who flow along down the river of pseudo-life. This is quoting Havel. We flow down the river of pseudo-life to the extent that we simply reaffirm the nostrum. Okay? Know that you're going to pay a price. Know that living well, living fully, living within the truth, living with honor, living in good faith requires that you pay the price. That's what I'd say to you. That's very inspiring. I mean, the way that I think about this is that it's a surprise of admission to being a writer or an academic or an intellectual. There's nothing dishonorable about choosing to be a banker or a businessman or an accountant. And for many people, that is the rational choice in life. You know, for anybody of real intellectual skill and capability, there's ways of making much more money much more easily than by going into this kind of trade, right? So do that. Go and be an accountant. Go and be a banker. We need those people. I mean that seriously and without any sort of superiority or derision. But if you're going to be a writer or an intellectual or an academic and you're making the sacrifices that come with that, your job is to actually think about the world and presumably your desire to think about the world is why you're giving up that more lucrative and easier life in the first place. And so... Don't choose this path in order to then not do the things that it actually should have attracted you to. I think in keeping with what we were just saying about iconoclasm and the courage of one's convictions as an intellectual, the future is in our hands and the stakes are really very high. And I think conversations like the one that we've been having here are really necessary. And I'm grateful for what technology has provided. I'm old enough to remember when it wasn't so easy to connect with people or to disseminate one's thoughts broadly So I'm happy to have had the opportunity to talk with you, even though we didn't agree in every respect. That's all the better, isn't it? It's it's so boring when you agree on everything. Glenn Lowry, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much, Josh. Thank you so much for listening to The Good Fight. Lots of listeners have been spreading the word about the show. If you too have been enjoying the podcast, please be like, rate the show on iTunes, tell your friends all about it, share it on Facebook or Twitter. And finally, please make suggestions for great guests or comments about the show to goodfightpod at gmail.com. That's goodfightpod at gmail.com. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Silent Partner for their song, Chess Pieces. Thank you.